So what you're saying is that music is eliciting a response in different parts of the brain, specifically the ones responsible for memories and emotions. Correct. Okay. And that and that also, that's mood and emotion side of things. The actual neurochemistry side of things, they actually found that music, when we, when we do create those responses in the brain, actually does influence our androgynous uh, opioid response, our dopamine response, different hormonal responses to music, whether that's music we like or we don't like. So, Michael, welcome to Evidence Strong Show. It's my pleasure to have you. If you could briefly introduce yourself. Absolutely. So, uh, my name is Michael. I am currently a strength and conditioning coach with the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare Candidate Course, where they go before they actually get selected for special warfare. Working on my doctorate right now, uh, going through the research process. I'm a dad, one child. So, yeah, I think that's about everything about me. All right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your PhD? Yeah. So, I am currently studying effects of music. Music on athletic performance kind of video was started out as a very vague topic trying to figure out what does athletic performance mean um, we have a bunch of definitions across the research if there's a definition various coaches will say different you know metrics they look for you know different whether it's character physical mental anything that they define as performance so took that general topic and had to synthesize it down basically into what the research was looking at within music and athleticism so the reason I picked this topic I've worked with a lot of different coaches in my career some coaches absolutely love having music they love the energy they love you know when the athletes are getting into it they're dancing around having a good time and then i've had coaches that absolutely hate that and they think music is a distraction and it completely ruins everything that we're trying to do in the weight room so i've always found music in my athletic career and now weightlifting career to always help me kind of stay centered and it's helped me stay focused and you know i've gotten into that energy before as a coach and as an athlete and i've always noticed at least myself that the sessions always seem to go better and what i mean by that that it is, um, you know, athletes will usually lift more weight than they intended to. So if we sit at, hey, we're at about an RP7 today or 70%, whatever we have to cheat, they would often report that, hey, that felt really light today when the music and energy was up versus a day where, you know, no music, whatever, whatever, and the energy is low. Usually that's almost hitting a max effort kind of day because they're just, the energy's not there. They don't have that same, I guess, drive or whatever that value is that we're trying to research that kind of makes that day difference. So in addition to that, uh, I've worked with high school as well. And I say high school specifically, because that's where I've noticed it the most, where coaches will use music as reward and punishment. So they would say, hey, we're not behaving. So we're cutting the music off. And I've always thought that was not the right approach to that. So I've, I, I've wanted to investigate what, if music actually does play a role in performance overall, or if it's just, you know, all in my head kind of thing. Further I dove into that topic, the more, you know, wild it actually got looking into the neurochemistry and the psychology of my everything as well. Awesome. Super excited to have you. Uh, the thing I love the most is talking with the researchers who are very passionate and motivated on the topic. So that's the best. So we know why you did the research. Could you just briefly say in terms of the methods you chose to research this topic? So before we go into what have you found is that we want to get there, but I would like you to just mention how you got there. Right. Um, so the methods we're going to be using, um, I have a school that's willing to work with me outside of the school I'm with. I'm going to work with their football team. And basically, I'm going to come into one of their lifts at the end of their lift. All the coaches have agreed to take my survey on the coaching side, which I'll get into that when we get deeper into the paper. But the coaches have agreed to take the coaching survey and they're going to volunteer, voluntold their athletes to take the uh, athlete survey. And I'm going to be there in person to kind of explain the background of what we're doing, what we're looking for, not in a way to influence the decisions, but just try to keep everything as honest as possible. And then from there, so it's going to be all survey based. And from there, you know, run it through all the statistical analysis that I possibly can to make sure that it's not just something that, you know, I'm looking for an influence or the athletes are looking for an influence. I want to make sure that it's staying consistent with the research if the research is even saying that and try to actually extract, you know, what the survey data is saying. Okay. So in preparation to the survey, you did some literature research. So you know what is there. Could you enlighten us? Absolutely. The way I did that is I looked at how music affects us psychologically, trying to stay as relevant 
to exercise as possible because that can get a very, you know, you get very crazy if you look at that. I looked at how it affects us physically. So the actual physiological response of our body to music. And then I tried to dive into any research into an actual perception of music on athletic performance. That last topic was very, very, very limited, very hard to find. So extrapolating a lot of information from the psychological and the physiological into what I think will happen into my hypothesis, uh, what I think the methodology will show. So kind of staying with those three topics, psychologically, the biggest takeaway is that the research kind of showed is that when we listen to music, it's not just something, and I think we all intrinsically know this, it's not just something we're passively doing. We're not just, hey, let's throw some music on and, you know, whatever, it's background noise. Music is always influencing us whether we are aware of it or not. The way that we, we know this is two studies that were done used functional MRI scan and a PET scan. And basically what they did was they introduced music, whether it was a preferred music, non-preferred music, different volumes, different tempos, a whole myriad of different variables of the music. And they assessed what the brain did under those conditions of music. And what they found is basically every condition of music influenced a different region of the brain that's responding to the music. What this alluded to was that a lot of our mood, our emotions, a lot of our uh, the way we process memories, anything like that, and directly be, directly go back to the music that we, you know, grew up with. That's why when we hear that song from childhood, you know, it brings back memories of childhood. That's all mapped in our brain. One of the researchers, uh, Wilkins, I believe, he actually took it from a, if you want to talk networking, like computer networking, found that, you know, when we listen to music, it actually creates local network responses as what he called it, the brain. So it actually created a localized response in that part of the brain that was being influenced by the music. And that That's what he speculates is creates the, that memory, that mood, emotion, whatever we're experiencing. So what he's saying is that music is eliciting a response in different parts of the brain, specifically the ones responsible for memories and emotions. Correct. Okay. And, that, and that also, that's mood and emotion side of things. The actual neurochemistry side of things, they actually found that music, when we when we do create those responses in the brain, actually does influence our androgynous uh, opioid response, our dopamine response, different hormonal responses to music, whether that's music we like or we don't like. And the one major study that found this actually introduced uh, naloxone, so Narcan, to their participants. And what Narcan does is basically uh, nullifies any effects of opioids. So it's an opioid receptor blocker. So if you take any, you, here in the United States, you know, hard narcotics is, is an issue. They'll give naloxone to reverse those effects. The reason I emphasize that is because what they did was they in, they gave naloxone to these participants and it actually dulled the effects of music. So to me, that was highlighting the actual significant response that our body uh, creates those androgynous opioids in our body that enough that we can actually give a synthetic drug that blocks that and it completely negated the effects of music on that person. So um, it's not just a brain region or psychological thing. It's an actual, you know, our body, you know, the neurochemistry in our brains, our endocrine system actually responds to music as well. So shifting into the physical side. So, you know, psych psychology, we were able to see brain scans and see where regions of the brain lit up uh, under music. We looked at the neurochemistry where, you know, they were able to introduce an opioid blocker and see a dulled response to music. Looking at the physiology, a lot of studies have found, you know, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, different blood pressure responses, all pre and uh, during exercise when music was introduced. Uh, changes in vital signs, so increased heart rate and, and respiratory rate when music was introduced either pre or during exercise. So a few of the studies introduced music as a warm-up where they would do a 10-minute warm-up with and without music. And other studies had them listening to music while they were doing uh, mostly a wing gate testing was most of the research. And both with music scenarios, so the group that was warming up with music and the group that was listening to music uh, during exercise separate uh, studies, they found different changes in the heart and the vital signs compared to the uh, control groups that did not have music. I hope that made sense in, in the rambling there. I got off my training. Yeah, yeah, I got it. So I think okay. so <laughs> what you're saying is that whether it was during the warm-up or during the exercise, the testing exercise itself, the physiology was changed due to listening to the music. Correct. Yes. So that's just our basic vital signs, right? So um, if we're connecting that to athletic performance, you know, if we're going out, if we have a, a competition coming up and our heart rate might be up or, you know, we're breathing a little bit heavy, we can theoretically use that music now to reverse that, right? So if I listen to calming music, I should be able to bring that heart rate down. I should be able to start controlling that breathing. Or the other scenario where maybe I want that heart rate to get even higher, right? I want to actually, you know, I want to be ready to go. I want everything amped up. I can take that exciting music, put that in my ears and I can go. I can let that heart rate get up, let that respiratory rate get up and then go out and compete.
compete or practice or whatever we need to do with using that music. So um, just looking at vital signs there, again, most of it was done through Wingate testing, a handful of treadmill protocols, but mostly with Wingate testing. Another, so I guess the main body of uh, research I was looking at with this study. Could you just uh, tell us a little bit more about the Wingate testing? Because maybe not everyone is familiar. Oh, sure. Um, so the Wingate testing is basically you're on a resistance bicycle and you're measuring power output essentially based on the wattage produced and the resistance on the, the resisted bicycle. So a lot of these protocols included, you know, they would come in familiarization period, they would get on the bike, find their resistance, they can keep meet a certain cadence. And a lot of these protocols were custom to the test being done. So um, they had different cadences, different power wattage they were looking for, different variables such as that. So um, they would come in for their familiarization period. They would uh, give their tracks or at least know what tracks are available. Uh, and this is getting ahead of myself a little bit, but um, basically what they found with the tracks was that when athletes listen to music that was preferred, so music they like, at a volume they like, they, they usually yielded the best result. So they would, so in that, with that knowledge, they would submit their tracks. So they would say, hey, pick a favorite song you like, and they would submit it to the researchers. Then they would come in, they would do that Wingate protocol. So um, some of them did, you know, 10 second bounce on the test. Some of them did 30 second bounce. Some of the, it was varying on the research. But basically you are pedaling at a certain cadence, trying to re replicate a certain wattage or see what a maximal wattage you can get, depending on, again, what the researcher was looking for. And then they would have a period of time, so uh, usually 24 to 48 hours of rest, and then they would come back and do that uh, exact same protocol again, usually one with, one without music, and they would measure the differences. Uh, did that answer the Wingate? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, looping back, my hypothesis for this whole paper is that when music is present, you're going to have a more or a lower RPE, so a lower rating of perceived exertion in the session. So I'm talking about an overall lifting session and the intensity is going to be lower. So you're going to feel like you're lifting less, which should allow the coach to push a higher intense session. So what I mean by that is if I'm saying, Hey, we're at 70% today, if I have music, then we should, that seven, that 70% should feel lighter. So we should be able to push to 75, 80% without seeing too many negative effects. Um, the negative effects is going to be a later, uh, further research kind of thing. But right now I'm just looking at does the music allow for a lower RPE with so to allow for a higher intensity session? So with all that in mind, a lot of the research, and I mean, basically universally, except for one study, found an increase in power output across the board when music was introduced, again, either during the test, testing, whichever testing they were doing, or prior to with a warm up or anything like that. There was one study that did use weight testing, and this is where it gets a little iffy with, you know, what I'm trying to research. What they did was they took 75% of their one rep max bench and they did a rep max test. So one group had music, one group did not have music, and they found the group that had music were able to complete more reps. However, the power on the bar did not change. So you can speculate there that they were able to complete more reps, so they were able to elicit more power, but the research itself, the power output did not change in that instance. So that's where this, this study kit gets a little bit, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. That's where I'm trying to synthesize out. But again, there were uh, other research throughout, and I can share a link of all the, uh, the studies that I have but um, another research found increased isometric uh, power and rate of force development. So, I mean, I can tie this into weightlifting here in a second, but uh, we can understand how that's very significant for weightlifting ability. And then we also had increased vertical jump and decreased ground contact time through that power output. So when music's introduced, we're able to produce more power, which seems to be what the research indicates. Sorry, the isometric study, what were the details, right? Of force development and was it the isometric testing? So was it the isometric testing was a mid thigh pull. Uh -huh. And then the rate of force development, they pulled up to their hips. So it was on a, uh, what do you call those machines? Like a Smith machine. It was like a Smith machine without the Smith machine. So they just had the bar attached to the cables on the side. <laughs> And they had the force, so they just pulled that up to their hips, basically measuring the amount of force into the into the force plates and then the pull on itself. And they found an increased rate of force development with the music. I can't remember the exact name of that machine they used, but the isometric power one, they just did a mid thigh pull um, on force plates and found an increased power output there as well. Was um, any of these studies done on weightlifters? So there were there were no studies done with weight, um, and that's where I'm trying to bridge that gap with resistance training in general. A lot of study, actually, a vast majority of 
of these studies done with music and exercise have been done on endurance athletes. Mm -hmm. And that's where they find the vital sign changes. That's where they find, you know, the, which we'll get into in a second, the rating of perceived exertion and time to fatigue. All of that has come from endurance athletes. So your treadmill protocols, wind gate testing, different stuff like that. The research into resistance exercise with music seems to not exist. I've actually had to rewrite this a few times because I can't find research into resistance training specific though. And that's just resistance training. So weightlifting specifically hasn't even mm-hmm. been on the radar. So, but again, as I said at the beginning, a lot of, uh, a lot of what we can infer from, you know, the research here, if we're talking about weightlifting, it's a rate of force development, it's a power sport. So if we're able to increase our rate of force development, we're going to have a stronger pull. And then if we're able to produce more power, that turnover, we're going to have a lot more height in that turnover. So we're able to stabilize that bar a little bit better and get a little bit more uh, weight on the bar. We're producing more power into that ground and more power into that bar. I do think that if, if we did a lot of music on the platform, you know, it might actually help lifters focus. It might help them, you know, increase their power output. Now, a lot of the research, again, around 10 minutes of warm up prior to the actual event seems to have a lingering power effect. But if we're able to keep that, you know, why, if we don't shut the music off and we're able to keep that power effect up, then that's even more power we're able to produce. So now we're just looking at technical proficiency and, you know, are you able to perform in front of people on a stage? But even the music, if we look at the, going back to the psych- psychological research, if we're able to, you know, visualize ourselves and able to kind of zone in on one thing and focus on the music that we have, if, even if we have that one headphone in, maybe that's going to help, you know, that one person get to that next level they're trying to. Maybe that's going to help them qualify for, you know, a national meet, an international meet, whatever they're going. It's a lot of maybe, but if we're, uh, the research is very clear that we can improve power output, which as a weightlifter, aside from technical proficiency, power outputs, you know, one of the main things we want to look at. So, um, so I don't know that, you know, if this research is going to, you know, blow the gate off of let music on the platform or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of back room, back room, you have music all over the place. You, everybody's got headphones in, if not speakers, sometimes I've seen even, and, you know, it's a good time back there, but just kind of letting that, you know, filter out into the competition area, I, th- I think will have benefit. I know there's some people that really want to be focused and they don't want any distractions and, you know, that's great, but maybe this isn't a distraction. Maybe this is something that could help, you know, that one weightlifter who may be nervous, just center in on something, you know, those memories, that brain patterning, just center in on a, a specific song will be like and turn everything else off and just complete the lifts that way. I have a question. What do you think would happen if we would have music that the up the song the athlete hate playing while so, so it's actually the reason they, they've done research into that. There is still a slight increase in, you know, the vital size, power output, everything like that when compared to no music. But when it's music they don't like, we definitely don't see that significant power output that we get. Um so there is still benefit to music that you you, you hate, but it's not the same as music you like, but it is better than no music. I Ironically enough. So they did cover that in some of in, in one study, I believe, had that covered. But they actually introduced, they actually deliberately played music the participant didn't like. And they this still performed better than the no music. So that's the main um <laughs> so, but it just speaks to, you know, how our body responds to just music, just to, you know, how our brain's gonna respond or our, our, our endocrine system's gonna respond with the hormones there. There I, I know now this is off the research because I know I've heard this so many times about your heart rate matches tempo. And you go on Spotify and there's all these, you know, be permitted, whatever, running playlists. For the life of me, I could not find that in any research. So I don't want to sit here and say that that's a thing. However, there's, there's a lot of empirical evidence that there, that your heart rate may match tempo there. So even if you have music you don't like, if it's at a high tempo, you know, you, your vital signs may still react. I'm, I'm, I'm saying may here because, again, I can't find that in the research anywhere. And if, if there is research on it, I, I would love to see it because I, I, I want to, you know, I want to know if I'm just crazy or if, if there's actually something to that. But so anyway, so that was every, that, that was uh, all the power output that I was able to find. The last section of the physical domain, so we're still under physical domain here, was the rating of perceived exertion flash and or time to fatigue that the researchers found. Um, now, the interesting thing about this kind of subheading here was that this was never a direct, uh, directly researched topic. So the researchers never sought to find, you know, an RPE or a time to fatigue or anything. Basically, it was just, fa- it was just in there in the data. It was in there, you know, just found alongside the studies. What's important to us is literally that's what my whole hypothesis is centered on. So um, that's kind of what I focused on was basically if music was there, was there a lower RPE and a longer time to fatigue? And again, this one is mostly on actually exclusively on endurance athletes. Um, there was no resistance training study on this one. However, with the endurance athletes, it was very, it was very, so it was very up and down, yes or no. The research wasn't very clear on whether this influenced RPE or time to fatigue. Time to fatigue seems a little more solid in that um, they had a treadmill 
email protocol where they block, they took a piece of tape and completely blocked all the data. So you can't see how far you've gone. You can't see how fast you're going. You can't see any of that. And they had the person get on the treadmill. So they vary the grade every two minutes and they basically just saw how far the person could go. When when there was music, they were able to go longer. When there was no music, they, they jumped off a little bit sooner. So, oh, excuse me. And this was seen through cycling testing as well. So just putting them on a, um, one of your regular uh, spin cycle bikes, they were able to go longer with music than without. And the RPE side of things, they, it was very subjective, which is what RPE is. Um, however, they weren't able to narrow down, does music influence your RPE or not? So one study, they said, yes, it significantly increased RPE. Another study said, absolutely not. It had nothing to do with it. One study said, eh, maybe we don't know. So again, it was very, it, it was never the directly tested metric. So it was really hard to synthesize whether or not it did have an, and if that was the influence or if there was some external or intrinsic motivation kind of thing that was influencing that person to go further. Um, and one of the, the the researchers actually says that as part of their closing thoughts is, you know, we can't say music is the one thing that caused them to go further because we don't know what their intrinsic motivations are, their extrinsic. We don't know what caused them to go further or not. It just so happened that when music was there, they were able to go further. So it, it, it was a very interesting, I guess, perspective for me to take saying, hey, maybe this will help increase or, you know, increase intensity in sessions because we have a lower RPE. But as I said at the beginning, you know, you have high energy because the music's up. When you have a group of people together and everybody's having a good time and you know because there's music there people are dancing singing and all that is the music what's causing the decreased intensity or is it everybody's feeling good and you know everybody's happy and having a good time that's causing that increased performance or whatever we want to call it so it, it's it is hard to say specifically if rp is going to be influenced by the music or not because that was the physical domain so yeah so the third uh the third domain so we did physical or psychological we just did physical the third domain was the actual perception of music on the athletes themselves um, and the, and there was really one researcher, I uh, was Yeats, who actually tried to do what I'm doing. He surveyed a bunch of uh, coaches, athletes, different stuff like that, but he gave them specific protocols as well. So with well, his study, two studies that he conducted, but he's the author of both of them. He instructed basically a region, so a whole region of volleyball uh, teams. So multiple schools, multiple teams, different stuff like that to create their own warm-up playlist within the guidelines of, you know, it had to be appropriate music and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was the only guidelines. So there was no, it wasn't genre specific. It wasn't, you know, it didn't have to have words. It could have been instrumental, whatever. It just had to be appropriate for, you know, their high school kids. So all the rules that follow with that. Um, the coaches were, were instructed to screen the music, but only to make sure it was appropriate music. Um, and all of this was because what they did was they played those, that specific warm up track while they were doing their pregame warm up routine. So, you know, it was, everybody was listening to it, the audience, all that. But what they found is so one game they would play the music, one game they wouldn't play play the music and so on and so forth. They would kind of vary that, right? And after, after all that was said and done, they surveyed the volleyball athletes and they surveyed the coaches. The athletes, you know, basically they they reported everything we would consider as, you know, SNC coaches and stuff. They created, you know, a closer that they, they they felt closer to each other because they created the playbook, right? Um, so they had to, you know, have a sleepover or whatever and come up with all these songs and get the order right and everything, they right? So they had to do all that together. So it brought them together and they usually did this during camp. So, so, you know, we're all going to do this shared experience. Then it turned into a ritual. So they said, hey, the seniors are leaving this year. It's now on you guys to create next year's playlist. So then wow. it turned into every every year it had to be, a you know, somebody had to carry that torch and create a new playlist. So it created that bond even closer. But what they found was the, the, the volleyball players, without even really being introduced to what was happening, they said they felt better during warm-up. They felt like they were playing volleyball better. So if we look at volleyball as a sport, they were uh, jumping better. They were spiking better. They were doing doing everything better, which are all power metrics within that sport. So if you're jumping better, you're, you're putting more power into the ground, you have a reduced ground contact time, like we mentioned earlier in the power uh, aspect. So they felt just generally that they were playing their sport better. They felt more energized. They felt, you know, a whole myriad of benefits and very, very, very little, you know, doubt, bad, bad side of it. The bad side was mostly when the songs were switching, it was kind of quiet, not, which, you know, I don't know if that's on the music or just the person playing the music. So, but the other studies, so the same author, Yeats, um, and 
another study purposefully in interjected different. Um, so like if they had, you know, a pop playlist, they would throw a country song or two in there just to throw it off. They intentionally did that. And the, and the athletes responded saying, hey, when this came on, I felt, you know, I, I felt off. I didn't really feel like myself. I didn't feel, you know, ready to go, anything like that. So a little bit of social engineering in there with the music, but they were actually able to see when it's music you like that you create, you are performing better versus music you don't like. And then you're like, hey, I don't, something doesn't feel right. I'm not ready to go. So, uh, but on the coaches side, so the other half of the study, the coaches side, the coaches reported that their athletes seemed more focused. So again, at the beginning, I said, I picked this study because I worked with a lot of coaches that said it was a stretch. Well, we're talking about pregame or so pregame warmup. And they felt that when the music was present, their athletes were more focused on, you know, the warmup and the tasks they were doing. So completely knocks that, at least subjectively knocks that out of the, out of the argument. They felt that they were more dialed in with their drills. So whether that's focused or not, but they felt they were a little bit more precise in what they were doing. They were a little more in the groove and the rhythm of, of things. They noticed the overall energy. So if you want to talk about participants or not spectators in the stands, they noticed the energy was up a little bit more than when it was not no music. A whole whole bunch of subjective data. However, it shows that when there's no music, there is a clear difference than when there is music on the athletic performance of these volleyball. So again, that, that was that was probably the most substantial studies studies that I could find music's direct influence on athletic performance. And it was two studies by the same guy. So it, what we do know is that it does have an influence on at least team setting sports during competition. The problem with that is my research of looking at in the weight room during a team session. So is it going to help inc improve, you know, if we're doing a, a rep max test, if we're doing a one rep max, are you going to be able to lift that little bit of more with music than without music? And there, again, as we already mentioned, there's not a lot of research into that. So that's hopefully what I'm going to be able to figure out. So last two questions. The first one is, what is your favorite color? Favorite color is blue. Or any any particular blue? I don't I don't I don't know the blues. I guess a darker blue. Darker. Okay. Yeah, a darker blue. Awesome. And if people want to contact you or learn more about your research, where should they where should they go? So as far as my learning more about the research, I just actually posted my dissertation perspectives on my LinkedIn. So if they just Michael Richards on LinkedIn, and then as far as just follow me or uh, getting in touch with me, I'm mostly active on Instagram at Coach Mike 300, all one no spaces or anything. And then I'm sometimes on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now, Coach underscore Mike 109. And then other than that, uh, they could just email uh, be Richard M8 at csp.edu. Yeah, that's pretty much everywhere I'm active at. So okay, I have a bonus question. What does 300 stands for in Coach Mike 300? That was my total that I hit at the Arnold. I finally hit 300 total, so I had to throw it in my uh, my hand. Wow. So I did a 139 snatch and a 161 cleanager. Awesome, congratulations! So just to balance that out. So thank you. Also, it was a pleasure, Michael. Thank you so so much for today, and see you next time when you will be done with your study. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much.